I thought something like this would come up, so I'm prepared with a <laughs> diagram. Oh dear. So. Given so much experience that there is in the Alpine Club, uh, I thought rather than just uh, focus on some dry facts, I'd share a case with you. This is a, a real case that uh, occurred in the late 90s, and I thought it would be useful uh, to be able to show you just how difficult it is to diagnose acute mountain sickness and perhaps some offer some uh, hints and tips along the way to try and uh, uh, help you in your, your mountaineering. Just a, a quick moment on acute mountain sickness. AMS in a nutshell, occurs in poorly acclimatized people above two and a half thousand meters. Uh, chances of you getting it depend upon uh, the rate you ascend, the, uh, the altitude you reach, and your genetic makeup. Symptoms are headache, dizziness, fatigue, and gastrointestinal symptoms. So anything from an upset stomach through to nausea and vomiting. Best prevented by ascending slowly, less than approximately 500 meters a day is normally recommended. But we know that drugs such as acetazolamide, that's Diamox, uh, can help the acclimatization process. So onto the case. Uh, the case takes place on this mountain, which I'm sure will be met very familiar to a lot of Alpine Club members. This is Mount Kenya, uh, taken shortly before an Alpine Club trip there last year. Uh, two peaks, Nellian in the foreground, uh, at 5188 metres and Batian just out of sight behind uh, at 5199. The case involves two climbers, Andy and Bob, whose names have been changed for the presentation. Uh, Andy and Bob got in touch uh, with us through our Mountain Medicine blog and over the course of a series of emails showed, uh, shared uh, their story. Uh, they were climbing the southeast face of Nellian which is there just above the right hand side of the, the hut roof. It starts there climbing up on that face and moves then out onto the ridge, which you can see on the right uh, is, in sh is casting a shadow there and the route takes a, 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 a le just left of that. So let's just show you a little bit of the southeast face of Nellian. Uh, it's a long route, you know, it's uh, best part of 16 pitches of rock climbing above 5,000 meters for most of it. Typically uh, ascent times four to eight hours. Uh, the route goes from Austrian hut, it weaves its way uh, to a starting point at about 4,800, 4,850, climbs the face, and then you encounter a first bivouac hut, uh, uh, Rusty Bailey's bivy there at 5,000 meters. Uh, that's for many people just a, a, a pausing point, but for Andy and Bob, it was in fact a, a destination. They decided to spend a, a night there at the Bailey's Bivy before continuing the next day uh, on the ridge, just to the left, past the DeGraff variation, the famous severe, hard, severe rock pitch on, on Mount Kenya. Goes at about 4A, 4B, but with a rucksack at 5,100 meters, it's, it's a good challenge. Uh, and then up to uh, Ian Howell's hut there, uh, just below the summit of, of Nellian at 5188. So that was their objective. And this was how they got to Austrian hut in the first place. I've put two curves on, on that. The, the green curve, the green line, is the line we followed when we climbed Kenya last January. You can see a very conservative ascent profile. So the first night spent at the park gates at Chigori at 2950 and then a very slow uh, and gradual ascent about four or five hundred meters a day with a rest day at just under four thousand meters and then finally taking six days to reach Austrian hut. Andy and Bob on the other hand took a more uh, positive approach shall we call it so they took uh, a night at the park gates at 3050 on the Mackinders route the next day went up to 4200 meters and from there, they decided then to get onto the route. So at that point, after two nights on the mountain, uh, they started at lunchtime and made their way to uh, Bailey's Bivy at 5,000 meters before eventually reaching the next day, uh, Ian Howell's hut there at 5,180. So two very different ascent profiles. This is Bailey's Bivy as of uh, uh, January 2019, largely clear of snow now. Uh, the door was lost many years ago uh, and does give room for uh, an uncomfortable bivy, but a bivy nevertheless. Now, 
when Andy and Bob arrived there, remember they'd left at about midday and started climbing. They arrived at about six o'clock in the evening. And these were Bob's symptoms. So arrived at the bivy at 16, 1800, sorry. Uh, they slept the night, albeit poorly. And at four o'clock in the morning, that was their time to wake up and set off for their next day. Bob complained of a headache. He scored it seven out of 10. He felt very tired and lightheaded. Now at the time they put it down, they put these symptoms down to a combination of different uh, problems. They were a little hungover. Between them they'd drunk a small bottle of whiskey the, the night whilst the, that they spent in Bailey's bivy. They felt dehydrated, they felt they hadn't carried the water that they should have done uh, and there was no snow to melt inside of uh, Bailey's bivy as there had been in previous years. They hadn't drunk any coffee for two or three days. They'd gone very fast and light and hadn't packed their coffee, so they were worried that they were withdrawing from caffeine. Bob thought he might have been brewing a cold, and he felt stressed. He, he was quite freely admitted that they were on a big mountain, and uh, uh, he was a little worried uh, for the day ahead. So instead of setting off at four o'clock, they decided to spend a couple of hours uh, resting. Bob took some paracetamol, they had a couple of cups of coffee, and they drank some water and decided to press on. So from Bailey's Bivy, as mentioned before, they need then to approach the de Graaff variation, the, the, the crux pitch. Well, unfortunately, they got a bit lost along the way. A few false starts, they, they spent more time on the ridge than they probably should. So yes, they, so they departed at 6 a.m., but didn't reach the de Graaff pitch until about one in the afternoon. So that was about six or seven hours from setting off. Now, that's only about 100 metres of vertical height gain, so it's a very slow uh, ascent profile, but admittedly they, they had a few false starts and had to retreat and find the route again. So they got to the top of degraph variation pitch a little bit worse for wear. This is the, 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 the degraph pitch as of 2019. Uh, uh, reminds me of a sort of Cornish sea cliff severe steep and a bit unforgiving but well protected. When he got to the top of the uh, uh, de Graaff variation at one o'clock the headache was now 10 out of 10. They were tired moving very slowly. Bob clearly remembered feeling very light-headed and nauseous. Wasn't able to drink much, uh, uh, drunk a little. Uh, now they thought the symptoms were a combination of tiredness, dehydration, a cold that was brewing, uh, and for the first time, they admitted to a bit of altitude. They thought, well, could altitude be playing a part? So they decided at the top of the pitch to take a 30 minute rest period, which they did. They took some paracetamol. Uh, they drank the remaining water. It was only a few hundred mils. And they, they made a, a, a change to their plan. They decided that Bob would only second and he gave all his kit to uh, his partner and they abandoned the idea of traversing the gate of the mist. That's the crossing over to uh, Batian. So they were just gonna climb to the Nellian summit and spend the night at the, the Howl Hut. So on they went, yep, to, uh, towards the Howl Hut. They eventually reached the hut at seven in the evening. So when you work it out, they'd been on the mountain climbing about 19 hours by this stage, so that was, slow by any any means uh, but they got there just before before uh, nightfall and those of you who who've climbed near the equator you'll know that how quickly uh, it gets dark you can be climbing one minute in, in broad light and then suddenly it's dark and they got there uh, on the stroke of around at seven o'clock and it became dark the moment they reached the hut so how were they shaping up there's ian's hut uh, a wonderful place to spend the night, I'd recommend it. Uh, 7 p.m., headache now, Bob's headache was 10 out of 10. Exhausted, unable to sit or stand, lightheaded and vomiting. He was tired, uh, they put it down still to dehydration, the cold, the altitude, but it was very clear uh, that Bob wasn't going anywhere. They decided that they'd rest the night in the hut and the following morning they made a decision that uh, Bob would remain in the hut and uh, his partner would descend. Uh, that's in fact what he did. And uh, 
uh, incredibly, uh, Bob's partner uh, did the, the 16 or 17 abseil pitches, uh, got down, uh, walked his way across the moraine, you can see there, and returned to the Austrian hut by late morning. Uh, and credit to the, uh, the rescue team and the, uh, the part warden there uh, at the hut, uh, they were able to summon a rescue team that reached uh, the hut uh, by mid-afternoon. And in fact, they reached the Howl Hut uh, sometime in the early hours uh, of, of the, the next morning. They were then able to uh, carry and lower uh, the, the uh, Bob down uh, the mountain and was able to reach uh, the Austrian hut later that afternoon. So an incredible effort by the rescue team that got Bob down with just, just over 24 hours he'd spent at above 5,000 metres. Uh, a helicopter was able to be called. The helicopter took him to Inyeri, uh, which is at about 1,700 metres, and he was able to walk off the helicopter. He woke up, and at 1,700 metres, his symptoms had vanished. Now, that's not dehydration. That's not a cold. That's not caffeine withdrawal. That is acute mountain sickness. That incredible recovery in just a few minutes from being almost semi-conscious and able to stand to being able to walk to, the ho walk to the ambulance, be seen in the hospital and be discharged an hour later and finding yourselves in a, in a hotel uh, later that day, symptom free, that's acute mountain sickness. And uh, credit to the team who rescued him without their help, uh, there's a very real chance that Bob would never have made it uh, and, and would have died on the mountain. So there are really three clues there that this was acute mountain sickness. The ascent rates that I showed you at the start of the, uh, the presentation, the symptoms, these were classic acute mountain sickness symptoms. And most importantly, they worsened with height. AMS gets worse uh, and it doesn't get better. Uh, and they were very lucky to survive. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to David. Thanks, David. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you very much for that case. Nigel, I hope we've had some questions come in. Uh, we have two from YouTube, David. Um, right. Shall I kick off? Um, and it's from Jules on YouTube. Um, how much does dehydration contribute to AMS? Would Bob possibly not have ended up in such a bad state if he'd been well hydrated? Yes, I think that's true. I think dehydration can be a real risk factor for acute mountain sickness. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that the converse isn't necessarily the case. Too much fluid isn't going to protect you from acute mountain sickness. And in fact, part of the acclimatization process is that you lose fluid in the first two to three days at altitude. So, in fact, a small loss of fluid is actually helpful uh, to the acclimatization process. But yes, in general, dehydration, uh, a risk factor for acute mountain sickness. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. That's great. And whilst we're on uh, fluid, we did have a question in saying that some of the drugs, uh, well, that uh, they believe the person believed there were some similarities between high altitude pulmonary edema and COVID pneumonia. Now, um, I've got some very strong views on this, and I know others have. Um, but could the drugs be used that are used for high altitude pulmonary edema? to buy time for descent, and I say to buy time for descent, not instead of descent, be used. Uh, Jeremy, can I throw that one your way? Well, I thought something like this would come up, so I'm prepared with a <laughs> diagram. <laughs> diagram. Oh dear. So, everybody, healthy lung, okay? Yellow, nice healthy lung. Alveolus at the bottom. Blue blood becomes red blood. That's good. This is high altitude pulmonary edema. Massive swelling of the blood vessels around the alveolus causes lots of breakdown of the alveolar capillary membrane. But everything else is pretty much intact. The damage goes on down here. Now, COVID-19, which is what I spend most of my day treating, looks like this. This is massive catastrophic breakdown of the epithelial lining of the lung. At the same time, you get massive inflammation, huge amounts of swelling in the interstitial spaces. And these airways collapse. 
leaving you with pretty much a destroyed alveolus, which is what I spend, I spent the last six weeks treating. This is very different to high altitude pulmonary edema. You might get similar symptoms. You might be breathless, you might have low sats, uh, you might have a cough, but they're two very different pathologies. And I think it's fair to say, Jeremy, if you use drugs that we use for pulmonary edema at altitude to buy time, you'll most likely kill your patient. <laughs> right. Um, I notice, Nigel, we've got some hands up in the audience. Derek's we do. always reliable. But, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll unmute Derek now. Uh, he's already unmuted. Are you there, Derek? Yeah, I am. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, fellas. I, you've, you've sort of covered a lot of major issues there. I mean, one point I would, what is, one point I was going to make, my, my policy has always been with altitude. I mean, often people do get headaches, you know, even, even people that aren't climbing too much at any one time. And often you find you fly into a high altitude area. For example, you fly into um, somewhere like Laster, or you fly into uh, um, the capital of uh, Bolivia. And that gives you a problem. So my, my approach has always been don't climb at all until your headache is controllable and preferably gone. Um, it's something you didn't actually mention, Jeremy, and, but I think this is quite important. If people are still climbing up when they've got a stonking headache, I think they're looking forward to trouble. Would you like to just comment on that, please? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I'm sorry if it didn't come through in the presentation, but yes, once a headache starts, it's not going to stop by going higher, for sure. And, you know, we should take it as, a, uh, as an early warning sign that our body is not coping with the, uh, the altitude that it's exposed to. The problem I think we're faced with is often we confuse headaches with so many other conditions and we almost talk ourselves out of the fact that it's actually AMS. But I think you're right, Derek, that we should all have a very low threshold that if we get a headache, we should assume that's uh, an acute mountain sickness headache until proven otherwise at altitude. Thank you. Chris, I, uh, I know you've got a particular interest in, um, in circulation in the brain and things. Um, I think your PhD was on something along these lines. Um, would you like to put some comments in there as well? In terms of headaches? in terms of headaches or any other gems you wish to share with us? So headaches are very common uh, and trying to distinguish um, a just an exercise headache from a high altitude headache from early acute mountain sickness right the way through to haste remains a challenge which uh, we still are trying to fully address. Um, what Jeremy has just said is if in the absence of any other uh, really compelling reason for a headache, you have a headache, it's likely to be mountain sickness if you've ascended recently. And you need to take the approach that you're going down or at least not going any higher until you address it. In terms of the mechanisms, very happy to go into all of those, but I think it's probably not the right place. I think you'd all be bored silly. Um, but would be happy to not have an offline discussion with people on that. Um, Lovely, thanks, Chris. Um, I notice a hand was raised by Mike there. Um, yep. Would you like to come in, Mike? Yep, okay. Um, question really about acclimatization. Um, yep. Some decades ago, in fact, more decades ago than I care to remember, I found myself climbing with somebody who had obviously acclimatized better than I had. And I mentioned this to him, and he replied rather sheepishly, uh, I've, oh, I've been spending a bit of time at the RAE Farnborough in the decompression chamber. Uh, nowadays, this does not, well, this isn't available to most people. And nowadays, I hear that people go into tents and you change the partial pressure of the oxygen by just pumping in more nitrogen. Are these two situations equivalent? Namely, the decompression chamber, which obviously emulates the mountain environment entirely? Or is that equivalent to the tent where you just change the ratio of nitrogen and oxygen and lower the partial pressure of the oxygen to correspond to the altitude you want? Are those two situations equivalent? Um, 
Mike, if no one else objects, I'm going to come in on this because it's something I feel quite strongly about. And the UI Medical Commission had a meeting about this recently in view of some of these very rapid ascents of Everest costing an awful lot of money for people who haven't actually most likely done much climbing before. Um, but uh, they carry double the normal amount of oxygen and uh, they're sticking their necks out. And I spoke with several of the people organizing these trips and several elite Himalayan climbers who think these things are great. Um, my One of the things I think sums it up extremely well for the average mountaineer is there is a center in London, which I'm prepared to name, called the Altitude Center which for quite a lot of money will set you up with this sort of thing. Um, this is uh, normobaric, normal pressure, sea level, hypoxia, lack of oxygen, as you say, as opposed to what we actually experience in the mountain, which is hypobaric hypoxia. But Chris, I think you wanted to say something there. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right to be cynical. However, the, if you ask the question, can you simulate altitude by giving a nitrogen rich mixture, the answer is yes. We're currently running a phase one study, or at least we were until the outbreak, looking at um, whether or not dexamethasone works to prevent high altitude cerebral edema. And we're using a number of uh, these hypoxicators and they generate acute mountain sickness very well. So going back to Mike's original question, you could theoretically use it. One of the problems is, how many hours a day are you going to do it? How high are you going to do it to go? And uh, how long will the uh, mild acclimatization last for? So it means you've got a real problem as to whether you're truly acclimatized or not. And I think without any of those sort of dose response curves and so on, it's a, quite a dangerous approach. And certainly I would advocate a much uh, spending a bit more time uh, in the greater ranges rather than trying to artificially acclimatize in a somewhat uh, unpredictable fashion. Uh, Chris, I mean, I totally agree with you. And yes, I have got a very cynical approach because I'm cynical to people who don't base it on science. Um, and I think the answer is the jury is out. And it may make a slight difference to some super fit, uh, really experienced uh, high altitude alpinists. And I'll certainly accept that um, now. Um, what I would say that in Bolzano now in northern Italy, they have a thing called the Terra X cube. This is a chamber large enough to drive more than a large piste basher into. And you can alter the wind speed, you can alter the precipitation, you can alter the altitude, you can alter the pressure, you can alter the gas mixture going in. And you can keep people in it. It has showers and toilets for many days. And this is the sort of environment where research is going to come from, which will actually give us answers to this. For the average mountaineer going to the Himalayas, I'd suggest you fly out two or three days earlier and go uphill a little bit slower, enjoying the culture, rather than waste your money on a tent in bed at home. Um, let's have some more comments. Shoot me down, please. David, can I come in? Yes, do. I, I agree with, with what you say, but the reality is, I think, that this is the future. That I think we will see over the next 10, 20, 30 years, people wanting to do shorter trips to the greater ranges and want to find ways to do that safely and successfully. And although I agree with you know, everything that you say, and I think slower climatization in the mountain, in the countryside is the way to go, I think as a medical profession, we will have to work alongside and with these people who are trying these approaches. I, I, I mean, I think it, it's a fantastic opportunity to study people in, in the mountains and extreme environments. It's something that we will have to work with in the future. Great. We've, uh... We've managed to get a little bit of disagreement, but not really between us. Um, but I've been asked to go back because I believe Nigel's got some more questions coming in. Yeah. And our time is going to be limited. Got a few more questions from YouTube. Um, we've got a question from Rebecca. Um, does experiencing AMS increase your risk of developing AMS again? And if so, would you recommend taking a uh, prophylaxis? Shall we go to Jeremy for that one? So just to break that down, I think that, yes, there's probably 
some evidence that supports the idea that the more you go back to altitude, the less risk you have of AMS. And there's probably some learned behavior there in that people learn ways to help their bodies acclimatize. I think as we get older, we go slower and more carefully. We pick different objectives and therefore we may get uh, less AMS. In terms of prophylaxis, I've got to be honest, I'm not a big fan. Uh, the, the commonest drug that's used, acetazolamide, uh, gives a whole host of side effects to themselves. In fact, if you look at the side effect profile of acetazolamide, the first five or six symptoms of, the, of side effects are AMS symptoms. So you could quite easily get headache, nausea, uh, fatigue, and lightheadedness from taking acetazolamide. Uh, it's not necessarily working. There's evidence that it works. Yes, it reduces your risk of developing AMS by about a third when you go to between four and 5,000 meters. It, it does work, but it comes with side effects. And going back to David's point, for the sake of just a few more days on the mountain, uh, taking it carefully, you can avoid acute mountain sickness and its complications. Jeremy, do you think there's any any legs in the tight box theory? Um, as, you, as your brain shrinks with age, there's actually more room for things to swell and buffer any cerebral swelling. Um, <laughs> I asked this because I recently had an MRI that uh, apparently was reported as normal uh, with some changes consistent with the patient's age. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of room in there, Paul, is there? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of room, yeah, they can rattle around. <laughs> well, on a serious note, going back to what Paul was saying, the, the first explanation for acute mountain sickness was, a, was this tight fit hypothesis. So the idea was that as you went to altitude, your brain swelled. Uh, and in those people who were older, who had a bit more room, that swelling didn't amount to much and didn't cause symptoms. And those people with a larger brain, uh, when that swelled, they got AMS. But it hasn't been borne out by research either in laboratories or uh, high altitude. I, I think, and Chris will be able to answer this uh, much better than I will, but I think the jury is still out on a, on a really convincing explanation of the pathway from a low level of oxygen to acute mountain sickness. I think that's uh, a question for the next generation of researchers to answer, and I, I look forward to hearing that. To a certain extent, we're trying to answer that question with the study we're doing, but I think going back to age and the risk of getting AMS, I think part of it goes down to experience. And the other thing is you can't move as quickly as you get older, I've discovered. So um, naivety of youth and being fit allowed me to get up mountains fast enough to get really sick. Now I move more slowly and it's less likely, but maybe it's an atrophic brain, I don't know. I'll go with another YouTube question. Um, regarding AMS, is there a benefit in using Diamox after the onset of symptoms or is it purely for prevention? Who wants to pick this one up? Well, I can. Uh, the majority of research that's out there just focuses on using Diamox to prevent AMS. There's very little that I've ever come across that shows it's of any benefit once you've got established symptoms of, of acute mountain sickness. Uh, and personally, I don't use it or administer it to those who've got acute mountain sickness. Chris, you coming in there? No, I, I, I think that cetazolamide can be used either for prophylaxis for prevention or for treatment. Uh, I think by the time you're talking about using it for treatment, you probably will maybe including other drugs like uh, nifedipine or dexamethasone. And really, you, you need to be thinking of heading down anyway, if it's that bad. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, a rest day can sometimes, uh, without going any higher, and sometimes pay dividends depending on how bad you are. Um, now... Nigel, did you say there was one more? Uh, one more from YouTube. Um, right. there, is, there have been some interesting anecdotal reports about ginkgo biloba supplements being useful as a prophylaxis against AMS. Any thoughts? Very difficult. The preparations of ginkgo uh, vary tremendously between different studies. Uh, tend to be very small studies, not particularly of great quality. Uh, Personally, I wouldn't trust them. Uh, I, I know there's a, a, an enthusiasm for uh, natural herbal prep preparations, but I, I don't think this really cuts it and, and doesn't stand up to comparison with, uh, uh, with more established uh, prophylactic drugs. Yeah, I looked through the literature a few years ago and couldn't find any good evidence. All right, Melanie. 
Hello. Um, I have a quick question about fainting. Uh, so I, I'm feeble, I know, but I, I sometimes faint at sea level as well. And I have had a couple of expeditions where I've felt faint, um, usually only between about 5,000 and 6,000 meters. I've, I've climbed higher and I've been okay. Uh, I just wondered if, if fainting is like a symptom of AMS, if it's problematic. To me, it's always been separate. I've always been like cognitively okay and in control and able to think, but feeling a bit faint. So I was wondering on your thoughts about your thoughts on fainting and, and AMS. Well, Melanie, I'll come in as a GP here. Um, yes, you obviously are feeble and pathetic if you only get up to six or 7,000 meters. I mean, this really worries me. Um, but I am also worried about keeling over at sea level. Uh, I love the uh, Southwest sea cliffs. Um, the trouble with fainting is there are a lot of different things to take into account. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is dehydration and things like that. And there are multiple causes. It's interesting. This does not sound like it's related per se to altitude to me. Um, but I'm more than happy again to have comments from others on this. Anyone else want to comment? Well, I think you need to look at the blood pressure um, because that's the key determinant in terms of blood supply to the brain and keeping everything working well. When you hyperventilate, you blow off uh, carbon dioxide, you actually vasoconstrict, you get less blood going to the brain. There are a number of potential things here. I suspect it's not AMS. I think it's just part of uh, acclimatizing. I think it would be helpful to know your blood pressure when you're not feeling well like that. The only other thing is, you know, on a rather more serious note, is whether or not you've got any rhythm disturbance or anything like that. Uh, Jeremy's probably got some views too. Yeah, I, as well, I think I mentioned earlier that it's typical for you to lose two or three percent of your total body water when you acclimatize successfully at altitude. So you are effectively dehydrated to perform effectively at altitude. It, it works. And I think I see a lot of female patients who typically have a, a low normal resting blood pressure of you know 100 systolic and that sort of loss of total body water will cause your blood pressure to be a little lower and if you're hot and a little bit dilated and you stand up quickly uh, I, I can see how a, a faint or, or f feelings of faintness ca can can occur if it's occurring at sea level it's well worth seeking uh, investigation actually yeah um, perhaps an echocardiogram and things like that just looking at the structure of the heart Chris's question. Well, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, is it possible to suffer a minor stroke through exposure to high altitude? And if so, could it cause permanent damage to the brain? This one is certainly one for Chris, I think, isn't it? So, uh, a really good question, Chris. Uh, yes, there's no doubt at all that you can suffer a stroke at altitude. One of the uh, factors that affects people going to altitude, and we've talked about it before, is dehydration. The blood gets thicker. It gets thicker anyway as you acclimatise. Um, and so you become much more at risk of either having a heart attack or a stroke. You can have different sorts of strokes also where there's not enough oxygen getting there, uh, um, but that's less common. There was some studies done um, about 2000 where they looked at MRs uh, on climbers, elite climbers have been to extreme altitude without oxygen. And there was some evidence of um, damage uh, on those brain scans. Interestingly, on scans that have been repeated, that seems to be less common, but it's a, it's a good question. It's very real, yes, indeed. And can I uh, just ask a quick one? Um, can anyone tell me if further research has been carried out on the use of beetroot juice to aid acclimatization? So, yes. 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 Se several uh, papers have come out just in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, they've not showed any benefit in preventing acute mountain sickness. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> I did turn up in the outs with a friend who opened the boot of his car and had 24 litres of beetroot juice in there. <laughs> he, he's actually a doctor as well. <laughs> I just laughed. Um, but uh, Chris, did you want to say something there? I saw you light up for a moment. No, I mean, it's, it's thought about the antioxidant properties and Damien Bailey down in 
uh, South Wales will be a strong component, but as far as I'm aware, and I'm sure Jim might want to comment, the evidence is very marginal, if at all. Um, thank you all. It's been a brilliant audience. We didn't know if it would work. And uh... Next week's Alpine Clubcast 8 is entitled Agui de Pelleron. Uh, Rab Carrington, Andy Parkin and John Bracey talk about new routing on the Pelleron. In February 1975, Rab Carrington and Alan Rouse brought hard Scottish-style climbing to the Alps with their winter ascent of the Terre Rebofa route on the Pelleron above Chamonix. 17 years later, Andy Parkin and Mark Twight climbed the nearby Good and Evil, uh, sorry, Beyond Good and Evil. And in February 2020, 18 years after that, John Bracey, Matt Helliker and Pete Whittaker added Beyond Reason. In their own way, each of these ascents have set new standards for our sport. Um, but why has this corner at a Chamonix agreed been a test bed for the best climbers of their respective generations? Find out next week. Um, do have a look at our Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, share uh, all the previous Alpine Clubcasts, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, stay active, stay safe, and stay alert. Good night from London. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.